Thank you, Roberta and Howard and the team at Bridge Projects for inviting me to give this talk. What I'm hoping to do today is to give you a glimpse, a feeling for the richness of Chinese Buddhist art, how the representation of Buddhist art developed, and in particular, the image of the Buddha, and how it has influenced the arts of China and continues to inspire contemporary artists. It all began with the Buddha, who was an historic figure who lived in the 6th century BCE. He was born into a royal family and was a prince from a Himalayan kingdom in what is now Nepal. The earliest extent Buddhist art does not depict the Buddha. Rather, it alludes to him, or literally, it embodies him. A stupa is a dome-shaped monument, which originally was thought to contain the ashes of the Buddha because he had been cremated. And later, these stupas became pilgrimage sites. Some early Buddhist art did depict human figures. However, they are, there are no extent depictions of the Buddha. Rather, there are aniconic depictions. So if you take a look at the top of this carving, you do see figural carvings. You see celestial beings, flying beings. And then in the lower register, and this is a bit of a detail, you have attendants and deities, de devotees who are kneeling down and praying to a bench or a seat or a throne, which evokes or symbolizes the image of the Buddha. Therefore, it's aniconic. Around the first century CE, anthropomorphic depictions of the Buddha began to emerge from three areas, each with its own distinct style that would later influence styles in China. In the far north, you have Gandhara, which is in present day northern Pakistan, Afghanistan. Then you have Mathura and you have Sarnath, both of them in India. The Mathuran style is generally characterized by colossal sculptures made of red sandstone and the combined influence of Hindu, Jain, and Buddhist iconography. Typically, the body is rendered with a broad torso and solid limbs. But I'd like to draw your attention to the refinement of the carving. The strength of the figure here is complemented by the treatment of this shawl, which is wrapped around the, the legs, the upper torso, and then thrown over the arm. So we get the sense that it is made of sheer fabric. So you have this juxtapositioning of a sheer light and delicate fabric against a strong stone, robust figure. Gandhara was colonized by Alexander the Great, leaving a Hellenistic artistic tradition. This style combines aspects of Greco-Roman sculpture with local traditions and reflects the imagination and highly skilled hands of those who carve these pieces, often creating animated scenes. So keep in mind that these sculptures were most likely originally colored as well. And the materials that were used in Gandhara were schist, stucco, and terracotta. The Sarnath Buddha, the Sarnath Buddhas are thought to be the greatest achievement of the Indian sculptor and together with the Gandharan style influenced the representation of the Buddha throughout China and India. The fusion and transmission of style into China seem to have happened rather quickly around the fourth century. This monumental gilded bronze Buddha, which is now in the Metropolitan Museum is dated by an inscription and clearly embodies aspects from both of these sculptures, the, the Sarnath sculpture and the, the, the Gandharan sculpture, yet it clearly has its own style. Same is true for this piece, which predates the last image by about a hundred years and is China's earliest known uh, dated Buddha. It creates, it, in fact, it makes sense given its date that the Gandharan influence is even stronger here as the Sarnath school had not even yet reached its, its zenith. This object is one of my favorites. It's a funerary jar that served the function of housing the soul. 
At the time when it was made, in the, around the fourth century, it was believed that the soul of the deceased split into two aspects, the Hun and the Po. So I want, to, I want to draw your attention to these little Buddha figures that decorate the jar. And they're seated in a cross-legged position. They're, they're definitely not as, as refined as what we just looked at. They're very folksy in nature. Uh, but what are they doing on a jar that was meant to house the soul? Uh, a jar that was found on the east coast of China um, in the fourth century. Well, it's possible that people were being, just beginning to, to be exposed to concepts of Buddhism and those who were proselytizing were borrowing concepts about the afterlife and other spiritual concepts from indigenous belief systems. And because the vocabulary had already been developed, quite well developed for hundreds of years, even hundreds and hundreds of years in China at that point. Um, and so instead of starting from scratch, reinventing the wheel, they, they, and because there was some overlap in some of the concepts, the Buddhists borrowed the vocabulary that already existed. And that may have also translated into sharing a visual language and combining iconography uh, on, on um, somewhat ritual vessels um, or um, objects that would have been used in a spiritual way. So how would these Buddhist images and Buddhist motifs even get to China? Well, there were some, there were, there were really two ways. There was overland and there were maritime routes. This is a map that shows just some of the maritime routes across Asia from the fourth to the sixth century CE. And you can see that from India, you could end up going up the east coast of China, up to Nanjing, not too far from Shanghai. And that is really not too far from where that funerary jar was found. The more uh, intuitive or obvious way may be the overland route. And you would be coming from India, you would be crossing the Hindu Kush, the Himalayan mountains, the Pamirs, the Karakorams, not particularly kind uh, terrain, very hostile, in fact, high mountains, snow-capped, and after you made it over the mountains, if you actually made it over the mountains without freezing to death, you would end up in Chinese Central Asia, uh, which is mostly a desert called the Taklamakan Desert, where the sand dunes are about 100 feet high, and on the northern periphery, you also have snow-capped mountains called the Tian Mountains, and then on the southern periphery, you have the Kunlun Mountains, which are on the northern border of Tibet. And these snows fed, created rivers that, that fed into the desert and created oases. Those oases became the way stations for the monks and the merchants who were traveling in this regime. So making it across here was, was really quite a feat. It was harsh, this topography. And it was these oases, it was in, in these oases that Buddhism flourished alongside the wealth accumulated from the trade. Cave temple complexes started in India. And Ajanta, which you see here, was a man-made cave temple site decorated with sculptures and mural paintings. And this concept of cave temples was transmitted along that, those land, that land route, which I just showed you on the map, into those oasis around the Taklamakan Desert into Chinese Central Asia. But let's take a look first inside some of these caves. The cave interiors include architecture and iconography. This cave is complete with a, with a stupa, and you now see a Buddha figure inside the stupa. So the stupa we I mentioned earlier is the dome-shaped monument that may have contained ashes of the Buddha or later in time may have contained ashes of a high-ranking monk, but it symbolized the Buddha. It didn't have any representation of the Buddha image. Now, as time has gone by, a few centuries go by, there's this conflation of 
putting sculptures or, or depictions, actual anthropomorphic depictions of the Buddha right in with the stupa. And you can see how elaborate the carving is. There is, in addition to this elaborate architecture, you have other uh, carvings which depict the Buddha at different stages in his life. Right in this, in this instance, he's shown here in a reclining pose, symbolizing his death and the moment of his complete enlightenment, which is called nirvana. His expression and the delicate placement of his hand between the ear and the pillow reflect his peace. Stone carvings were complemented with painted murals of a very refined nature. These two figures are bodhisattvas, beings who have accumulated enough karma through their reincarnations to reach nirvana, but delay it to stay connected to the material world and help all sentient beings get on the path to enlightenment. So now we'll cross back into Central Asia around that Taklamakan desert on the northern periphery where we find a number of important cave temple sites. This cave temple complex, um, the idea of making cave temples and cave temple complexes really suited the topography of Chinese Central Asia around the northern periphery of the Taklamakan Desert. Uh, because you had rocks, uh, you had stone, I should say, and the stone wasn't very, very hard. It really, it allowed, to, it allowed itself to be easily carved and hewn. The style that we see, the, the, these are stucco uh, sculpture fragments from the Kizil Caves, these at the top. And here you can see that there's a strong influence uh, with styles from Gandhara and even from Persia. This is a fragment of uh, a detail of a, of a mural painting. And so a new Central Asian style was evolving, which combined Persian and Chinese elements, along with Gandharan elements. This scene illustrates the cremation of the Buddha. And here you can see the, his casket, his coffin, and then the flames coming up. And he's surrounded by his mourners. We are praying down below probably you know, wailing, you know, closing the coffin. The bright blue and green pigments derived from lapis lazuli and malachite and the other colors from natural pigments. Another site uh, on the northern periphery of the Taklamakan Desert is the Bezeklik Cave Temple Complex, where the exchange of people and cultures intertwined. This detail of a painted mural encapsulates the zeitgeist of cultural exchange thanks to the Silk Road. A Central Asian monk on the left, in dialogue with a Chinese monk on the right, rendered with skilled Chinese brushwork while integrating elements of iconography from India and Central Asia. This exchange on so many levels eventually made China the center of Buddhism, Buddhist art and culture, as it was waxing in India with the rise of Hinduism. At the heart of the matter were the monks. Hand in hand with the iconography were the texts or the sutras that were translated into Chinese. Fa Xian, a monk and translator, set out alone from China in the year 299. And he traveled through the Western regions of China into the Central Asian area, across, not around, but straight across the Taklamakan Desert, over those hundred feet, foot high uh, sand dunes, uh, into over the mountains, into India and Southeast Asia, and then returning by sea to China in 412. In search of, he went on this journey in search of authentic Buddhist texts and teachings. His, te his journey, part pilgrimage to sacred sites is documented in his travelogue, A Record of Buddhist Kingdoms. His contemporary, Kumarajiva, a Central Asian monk from the Kisil Cave area was, was also pivotal in the spread of Buddhist texts into China as he studied in Kashmir and in India. Uh, he studied the original texts 
uh, and translated from Sanskrit into Central Asian languages as well as into Chinese. Uh, perhaps the most famous of all the monks is Xuanzang. Uh, and he was a monk translator who lived in the seventh century in the Tang Dynasty, in the period of the Tang Dynasty. He was compelled to resolve the issue of apocryphal Buddhist texts during his lifetime. He set out undercover to Central Asia and India because it was illegal, in fact, to travel in those regions at the time. Um, and he set out to acquire authentic texts. Upon his return to China, after 17 years on the road, he devoted his life to text translation. And so the reason why he was compelled to do this is because there was just, they had lost the thread of what was authentic and what was apocryphal. The texts had become so commingled and corrupted uh, with, um, with misinformation um, that, you know, it was very hard to really understand what was genuinely a Buddhist text. So he traveled from Chang'an, which is Xi'an, uh, current day Xi'an, in the middle part, north and central part of China, over these rest Western regions. And it was really, it was illegal at the time to do something like this. So that's why he went undercover. And then from here, he traveled overland uh, along the northern periphery of the Taklamakan Desert, and then went even higher up into what is current day Uzbekistan, uh, over into uh, uh, Afghanistan, northern Pakistan, and then down into, this is where Gandhara was, and then into the Mathura area, into the Sarnath, where the Sarnath era, uh, school was, and then, well, it's not exactly a straight line. We're not really sure if he went this way first or, or around here afterwards, but he makes his way eventually uh, uh, over here, to the southern part and then is able to cross back over up again and then back into China over the mountains and then follows the southern periphery of the Taklamakan Desert to this to these oases which were Buddhist kingdoms. Hotan was a major Buddhist kingdom. By the time he reached here and he had texts with him and, uh, and you know, many donkeys and camels carrying his materials word got out to the emperor over here and, uh, and, an, and a full imperial escort was sent to bring him back into the capital. And this is where he finished off his, the rest of his life translating the texts. His journey, Xuanzang's journey, was filled with adventures, including even being kidnapped uh, in one of the oasis on, the, on his way out on the northern periphery. Uh, and so his, these adventures from his story became the inspiration for the, the 16th century novel, Journey to the West, which is one of the four great Chinese novels. It was written in the 16th century. And the story became embellished with Xuanzang's travel mates. In fact, Xuanzang himself becomes eclipsed by his travel mates because they have superpowers, like monkey who can travel thousands of miles in a single leap. Journey to the West, or monkey is arguably the most popular East Asian story, even today, and it continues to inspire. It is one of the most famous Chinese operas. And in its traditional Chinese opera rendition, it includes martial arts and antics, especially by monkey. Um, and it is, and in its most recent contemporary version, uh, Lincoln Center, it is a mixed media choreography and musical. Not to mention, the inspiration continuing with his biopic, which I recommend watching. It's actually quite good. And it was produced by uh, one of the most um, talented Chinese, chore uh, Chinese directors, Wong Kar Wai. So back to the caves. If you are traveling up the Yellow River, from, from uh, the city of Lanzhou, for about 10 hours, you'll come across this site, which is called Binglingse, and which has a precedent in the Bamiyan Caves in ancient Gandhara, which is now Afghanistan. This is, a, this is, a, this is a, 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 an image of 
of Bamiyan, and you can see here the, the place where a monumental Buddha would have been, and another one over here, and then you see these dots over here. These were, these were the cave temples. Go back. The monumental Buddha, uh, which stood until 2008, uh, is, is pictured here. And then in 2008, it was unfortunately blown up by the Taliban. At the crossroads of the Silk Road in China's western regions is the oasis of Dunhuang. So once you cross these mountains, and whether you go along the northern periphery of the Taklamakan or the southern periphery of the Taklamakan, eventually you're going to end up here at this juncture. And that is an oasis called Dunhuang, which became a very wealthy trade place with many Buddhist adherents who commissioned cave temples called the Mogao Caves. This complex has 492 decorated caves and niches. There are, some of them are extremely large caves and the niches can be very tiny. And several other undecorated caves that were residential spaces for the monks and the artist community. It is built into a sandstone cliff and it is surrounded by sand dunes. The site was active from the 4th to the 14th century and then suddenly was abandoned. Uh, there was a shift from, and this may be explained because there was a shift from land trade routes to maritime routes result, resulting in a, a decline in wealth at, in, in these oases as well as a changing political situation. There were invasions coming from Tibet uh, and other surrounding areas and a general instability in the area. As a result, the wooden structures that originally protected the entrances to the caves, they would have been, you know, for example, here, this wasn't originally just exposed to the elements, they, they eroded. Sand blew in and the cave blew into the caves and filled the caves and the dry climate, together with the dry climate, it only rains you know, a couple of millimeters uh, every year, uh, inadvertently protected the painted murals and the sculptures from being completely destroyed. The site was rediscovered in the early 1900s and it looked something like this when it was rediscovered. But since the 1940s, it has been properly protected uh, a door has been put on every cave. Some of the niches are still exposed. Um, some of the murals are still exposed, like you see here, but these were already in, in pretty bad shape. And originally there was probably a much larger wooden structure. You can see remains of it over here and then a bigger one over here that would have covered it. So that hasn't been reconstructed. When it was rediscovered, the site, when the site was rediscovered in the early 1900s, a hidden cave within a cave was also, was also discovered and it was filled to the brim with manuscripts and silk paintings. So this is a very large cave. And over here, there's a little window which had been all sealed up by, over here. It wasn't so obvious, but inside this little cave were the documents and the scrolls. The, they were all scrolls. They're scroll documents and scroll paintings. You have silk banners. And among the, included in the cache was the oldest known book in the world to have survived intact. It's an illustrated Buddhist text in its Chinese translation, which is now in the British library. It's the Diamond Sutra. So let's take a look inside a few of the caves. Cave 254, which dates to the 5th, 6th century, is pretty much intact and was never restored. It is essentially a 6th century capsule of Silk Road Buddhist art and culture, architecture and iconography. The central pillar and the seated figure call to mind what we saw in the Ajanta caves. So here you have a central pillar and a central figure. And if you recall, this was the Ajanta cave that I showed you previously. The 
the pillar itself is now it's, it's, it's square in shape instead of being circular, the stupa was circular, but eventually what happens is that stupa shape morphs into being a, a square shape, which is the shape of a pagoda. And it was meant just like a, just like a stupa, it was meant to be circumambulated. So a worshiper would walk around in a clockwise rotation, bearing their right shoulder to the objects of veneration. You have the main uh, figure, the main Buddha here, and then you had niches on, on all four sides, which also contained sculptures of the Buddha. Uh, and you would walk around and circumambulate in your clockwise, clockwise rotation as a devotional act. It is my opinion that the thousand Buddha motif, which you see here and is also all around on all of the walls, were also part of the devotional rituals that were performed in the cave. Each Buddha in the motif had a name written in a cartouche next to it that corresponds to the names listed in a sutra or a Buddhist text called Names of the Thousand Buddhas that was found in the library cave and dated to the period of the cave. So it's, it's really just, it's fascinating once you can connect the dots and you can see where ideas have come from, how uh, styles have evolved. And then when you have textual evidence right at the very site of the cave that indicates which texts were important because they were supposedly important because they were saved inside of that, that, that um, library cave. And we don't know why they were all put into that cave, but we, we can presume that there was some kind of, of threat and danger and so important texts were put in there. And to think that a text is going to be translated into uh, an overall, I can uh, be part of an overall iconographic program in a cave gives us an idea of what was involved in, in, um, in, in creating these caves and in decorating them. So if we fast forward to the 8th century and the layout of this cave and the iconographic pro program, we see that there is a complete change. And this suggests the way the cave may have been used for devotional acts and the contemporaneous sutras or Buddhist texts that were prevalent at the time influenced, continued to influence how the cave or the caves were created. But one could imagine an altar table with offerings placed in front of this platform or elevated platform that has the Buddha surrounded by his main disciples and, uh, and bodhisattvas and uh, other Buddhist deities. And it may even be similar to how uh, freestanding temples were you know, the interior, what, what the interior of freestanding temples looked like. By the time of the Tang period in the art, the art in the Mogao caves became its own distinct style. Yet we are reminded of its ties to India. So here we have at the top, we have the reclining Buddha and you recall the one from Ajanta, uh, but rendered in, in its, its own mobile style with, and, and here we have the mourners who are carved right into the, the base or even the, um, the uh, coffin, or not the coffin, but the standing at the base of the coffin. And here the mourners are painted onto the walls. You see a detail here. What's fascinating if you take a close look is you see, if you see the hats and the faces of these figures, they're all characters from Central Asia with these really elaborate hats, this one with the fur around it, the peak cap coming over, uh, the long strands coming down, uh, like a Kazakh or a Kyrgyz style type of hat over here. So we get an idea of, of, of the, the diversity of, of cultures that mixed and mingled and were really part of, of, of daily life at this time. Given its distance from the capital, the Mogao caves were way out in the Western regions. In the, during the Tang period, seventh to 10th century, 
the, these paintings were far from provincial. They have been a major source of inspiration for Chinese artists since they were rediscovered. In the 1940s, Zhang Daqian, one of China's most famous modern artists and one of China's most famous forgers, studied the murals. He even lived at the caves for a number of years. And to this day, almost all Chinese fine art students still make the pilgrimage to the caves to study the art. Contemporary composer Tan Dun's Dunhuang project is inspired by the Mogao murals depicting musicians and instruments. And fashion designer Vivian Tam has traveled to the, to the caves and, and even designed a line based on, on the murals. Two other very important cave temple complexes, among many others, and I'm only selecting just a few to talk to you about today, are the Yungang Caves, which are in north, northeastern, not completely eastern, but more eastern, north to the east, pardon, the northeast part of China, but not the far northeast. And the Longmen Caves, which are along the Yellow River. In addition to cave temples, there were freestanding temples in abundance that were decorated with Buddhist imagery. These sculptures were accidentally discovered in 1996 when a, um, a sports yard was being constructed in a, in, 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 on the grounds of a school. They were, the, 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 these sculptures were buried um, probably around uh, 1200 to 1250. CE for reasons that are still unclear. Uh, and it, originally they were on the site of a temple, which is now long gone. The sculptures themselves date to the six, date to 529 to 577 CE. And the cache contained 400 sculptures and 35 of them are very well preserved examples that you see here. Plus there were coins, ceramics, lacquered wood, and cast iron fragments. These sculptures are arguably from a golden age in Buddhist art. What was so surprising when they were discovered is that no one had an idea that such sophisticated and skilled Buddhist sculpture was being created in the sixth century in Eastern China, indicating that there is still so much we, know, we don't know about the evolution of Buddhist art in China how and where it evolved and how it connects to Buddhist art and culture that was transmitted to Korea, Japan, Vietnam, and beyond. So these, this cache was found much more to the east from where the last set of cave temples that I showed you, uh, the Longmen Caves and, and the, and the Yungang Caves, which in themselves are quite far east from the Taklamakan region and from Dunhuang. The Tang Dynasty, which dates from the 7th to the 10th century, is revered as China's golden age. The capital itself had 100 inhabitants within the city walls. The diverse influences, the culmination of styles from India and Central Asia, converging with Chinese artistic techniques, reflect the cosmopolitanism of Tang China. And these are just a few examples of the height of Tang Buddhist sculpture. You have a lacquer piece, which is quite large, and it doesn't weigh very much because it's hollow, and it was used uh, in Buddhist processions. This piece, a gilded, uh, a gilded bronze, about eight inches tall, would have likely been used for personal devotional uh, practices, perhaps in a, a, a family or a, 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 um, a personal family shrine, or it could have been in a temple or given its high quality may have even been inside an imperial temple. And then you have this uh, exquisite torso, elaborately carved. We see not a straight columnar style like we saw, like we see here. Here, the emphasis is really much more on the face, the facial expression, the eyes. And even though it seems so simple, these objects are able to, to convey a sense of inner peace. The bodies themselves are not, you don't get a sense really of the, the muscles or the body shape. You get a sense of 
the, the, the clothing that they're wearing or the, the garments that's, that they, they have uh, over their bodies, but and even the layers that are there. And in this case, you see the, the jewelry and the adornment, and there's an emphasis on that. But not so much on trying to make it, trying to expose a shape to the body. And there we see a big change by the time we get to the Tang Dynasty. This hip throwing that comes out, it's called a tree banga. It's almost like a dance position. And, um, we, and we, we get a sense here also of the, of the stomach muscles and everything would have been in, in perfect proportion. The next major dynastic period, the Song Dynasty, 10th to 13th century, saw a huge loss of territory compared to the Tang. Essentially, the Western regions and the area, which is now Mongolia, that had been part of the Tang Empire, empire was lost. The vibrant openness of the Tang shifted to a more inward perspective, and this sentiment manifested itself in the arts of the time. This detail of a hand scroll painting depicts a pagoda on West Lake in Hangzhou and reminds us of the architectural achievements in Buddhism, which later became the source of inspiration in decorative arts. The most significant development in Buddhism during the Song Dynasty was the flourishing of Chan or Zen Buddhism. And Zen is usually associated with, with Japan, but it originated in China. Chan Buddhism was a major Chinese Buddhist sect attributed to Bodhidharma that emphasized attaining Buddhahood through enlightenment of one's own mind. Bodhidharma, a Central Asian monk from the fifth or sixth century, was said to have meditated in the cave, staring at a wall for nine years. Nobody was paying any attention to him. He ended up uh, in an area um, where the Shaolin, in an area called uh, the Shaolin uh, Monastery or Temples. It was, a, it, made, it was an important Buddhist center and still is. Uh, and it's renowned for its Buddhist, uh, for its martial arts uh, training. He ended up there uh, and found, a, apparently found a cave to live in and just stared at a wall, stared at a tree, just stared and meditated for nine years in, until he really caught the attention and the, the trust of the, the local Buddhist community. And from that point on, he was, he was able to develop, uh, form his, his, his sect of, of Chan or Zen. And as we all know that that form of Buddhism went to, to Japan and, and still flourishes today. Whereas in China, after the Song Dynasty, it kind of faded out. Yet its influence is still so powerful. The contemporary artist Song Dong did a 10 day performance silently facing the wall in homage to Bodhidharma. And this is a still from that performance. The Song painters reached a height of refinement and technique. This portrait of a Chan monk shows us how monks, uh, how monks at the time dressed, how they adorned themselves. Uh, it gives us an idea of what fabrics and furniture look like. He's sitting in this chair uh, and, and the back of the chair is even covered with a, a fabric that has designs that we can, we can recognize immediately as being from the Song period. The teachings of this Chan monk were highly regarded and were disseminated to China by his Chinese disciple who studied with him in China. Here we get a glimpse of how Buddhism was spreading, not to mention the arts related to Buddhism. This painting became, eventually be, was taken back to China, uh, taken to Japan and became part of the collection of the Tofukuchi Zen Temple in Kyoto. Portraits of monks were also rendered in ceramic. These represent two of the original disciples of the Buddha, albeit transformed from Indian figures to Chinese figures, as shown in their facial expressions. The Song Dynasty was also known for its cel celadon glazes and advancement in ceramic production and innovation. 
The subtle color of this celadon suits this ceramic sculpture of a bodhisattva. And by the way, I, I, a bodhisattva is, is um, a Buddhist being, is, is a Buddhist who has attained enough good karma and has gone through enough reincarnations and has accumulated enough wisdom and enlightenment to uh, make, to end their, to, to get to the final goal which of, of a Buddhist, which is nirvana. Uh, and then that would end their, their rounds of reincarnation. But they decide to stay connected to the material world to, this, to help all sentient beings get on the path. And so in, in a way to demonstrate their connection to the material world, they're often bejeweled. Um, and another explanation for, for the jewels uh, or the, 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 the adornments on bodhisattvas is that the Buddha himself was originally a prince and presumably a bodhisattva at the time that he was born. Um, and being a prince, he would have been adorned with a lot of jewelry. So here, the subtle color of this celadon really suits the ceramic sculpture of the Bodhisattva and her serene expression. Had she been colorfully glazed like the disciples in the, in the last slide, the figure would not convey the same feeling. Perhaps as a complement to the minimalist glaze is the elaborate modeling of the jewelry in the garment where the ceramicist was able to show off uh, their technique in, uh, in modeling. The fall of the Song Dynasty to the Mongols led to the opening up of territory once more, uh, almost regaining exactly what we had in the Tang Dynasty. All the Western region opens up because that was under Mongol control and the arts flourished. The influence of the Mogao caves continued, albeit it was coming to the end of the height of the period of the Mogao caves and slightly, you know, around the four, uh, in the 14th century, there's um, a shift and, uh, and people are moving away from those caves because of the instability in the region. But, how, but it, it's, it's important to note that the influence of the art from, the, from those caves is transmitted right into the heartland of, of China. In Hangzhou, where, uh, which, which was a, 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 an important cosmopolitan center, the iconography in a cave temple site there, thousands of miles away from the Mogao caves is directly emulated. As are the Buddhist motifs and styles shared between Mogao painters and sculptors from other parts of the Chinese empire. As well as the sharing of motifs between textile artists and, uh, and, and metal craftsmen or metal workers. Buddhist art and culture continued to evolve during the next 600 years under the Ming and Qing dynasties. This monumental head always moves me when I walk past the Metropolitan Museum. It's in the stairway between the, the Chinese galleries on the, on the upper level and the Egyptian galleries on the main level. And it reminds me of a piece by a contemporary artist, Zhang Huan, who is a practicing Buddhist and has created a number of artworks that include a Buddhist iconography. In this piece, the, 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 Buddha, the Buddhist sculpture on the left is made out of about 20 tons of incense that was collected from many temples in China. And then he molds it and compresses it into, into the shape of, of, the, of the sculpture. The decorative arts with Buddhist themes like this set of mourners surrounding the Buddha at his death tell us, thanks to its inscription, who and why this set was made. It was commissioned by a monk as an act of devotion. As China's dynastic period comes to an end with the Qing dynasty, there is at once a harking back to the past with this lacquer piece that calls to mind the Tang 
lacquer processional sculpture from the seventh century and innovations with new motifs like this laughing Buddha. I'd like to close with a poem by an American poet, a Buddhist who lived in Vermont. It is a reminder that Buddhism has inspired people for millennia and continues to resonate in contemporary culture. On the road to Buddhahood, ever plainer, ever simpler, ever more ordinary. My goal is to become a simpleton. And from what everybody tells me, I am making real good progress. Thank you.